I'm going to start from the Shakespeare play Hamlet, Lord Polonius's speech to his son Laertes, and it's an old man giving advice to his son. And as I explained, I believe that this is a parody of the advice which Cicero is giving in his treatise on duties to his son. Here we go, from Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 55 to 81, the speaker is Lord Polonius. Yet here, Laertes, aboard, aboard for shame, the wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. There, my blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory, see thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bet that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they, in France, of the best rank and station, are of a most select and generous chief in that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell. So, obviously in language they're different, but the thoughts are similar, because Cicero is giving so much advice. Balance this out, and do this, but not that. It's very representative of, if you read all this stuff, you kind of know what the Romans thought about public life, and about a lot of different stuff. And it's a, it's a very informative text in that way. Okay, so let's go into this idea that law and justice are not the same thing. What I always think of in the separation of law and justice is the Godfather, right? Because at the very beginning of the movie, The Godfather, um, Don Corleone, his daughter's getting married, and all these people are coming to ask him favors. And basically, it turns out that the just thing, according to all common sense, is not the same thing as a legal thing. For instance, this guy, the, this, this person who comes to Don Corleone, his daughter's been beat up, his, her face is ruined for life, and the guys that did this to her get off with a suspended sentence, they don't even go to jail, and they're laughing at the father as they go out of court because the judge is a corrupt. So the a father whose daughter's been ruined for life goes to Don Corleone and asks for justice outside the law because the legal system is operated, but it clearly an unjust outcome has occurred. And the whole idea of the mafia in this movie, The Godfather, is that certain people have to go outside the law for justice because of their situation. So Cicero says he, more laws mean less justice. And he, he cites that as a popular saying. The more laws you, you put on people, the more injustice you create, especially if the laws themselves are not just. So now go further down in that paragraph where it says law and justice not the same. I think this is slightly amusing. After a 30-day truce with the enemy, a famous general ravaged the enemy's fields by night because he said the truce called for peaceful days, not peaceful nights. Cicero says this is you know appalling. We should avoid these sharp practices. Okay, let's go on. The curse of human conflict. As greatly as cooperation blesses us, no curse seems more terrible than man's inhumanity to man. And so he goes on to say there's this Aristotelian philosopher who cataloged all these causes of destruction, floods, famines, plagues, et cetera, et cetera, that would have wiped out whole peoples. And then he shows by comparison how many more people have died through the assault of other people by wars or revolutions than by any natural calamities. And this is a great theme in Western history, which is man's inhumanity to man. So last night we talked about this ode to humanity that Cicero has and that other Western thinkers have where they kind of hold up man as this great thing. But again, it's he's the, the most godlike or the most beast-like of all animals, precisely because his reason can be perverted. Let's talk about the case for tyrannicide. Cicero thinks it's okay to kill tyrants. And I want to add... That becomes a very important idea. And many of the authors who are big in the Catholic Church, like St. Thomas Aquinas, took up this idea that you, that's from Cicero, that it was okay to kill a tyrant. 
But Thomas Aquinas put, and we'll get to him in a few weeks, put certain conditions on it. So if you're going to kill a tyrant, it can't just lead to civil war. You have to have some government ready to replace it. Because chaos and disorder might be worse than the tyrant you have. So you have to know that it would lead to a better result than the one you're replacing. And there's like three conditions. But I just wanted to flag that for you because it's really the first place that idea emerges that it's okay to kill tyrants. And thus I revised my statement that Cicero didn't contribute to any original ideas. I think that's one of them. And I think it was probably because he thought Julius Caesar was out of control. And I think probably he thought, well, since Caesar kind of ruined the Roman Republic, it was okay for um, Brutus and Cassius and all the other people to kill him. Let's go on to nature's social principles. This is an important one. The idea that nature itself forms the basis of society, in Cicero's view. And then he talks about a still closer union exists within the family. And he you know, talks about bonds between brothers and sisters and of cousins and like that. And then he says, the home serves as the foundation of civil government, the nursery of the state. So his idea is that if, without solid family ties, you can't have a stable society or a stable government. So look at the stable societies. Look at Asia and China. They have very strong, stable family ties. In the underclass in the United States, family bonds are not there because most of the children are had outside of wedlock. And so they're not, the parents aren't married. The father doesn't stay around. The kids are, have no one to supervise them. So the kind of society that comes out of that is very tends to be very disruptive and violent and undisciplined. So this is a means of kind of understanding that. The home serves as a foundation of civil government, the nursery of the state. He says, of all the bonds of fellowship, none seems more noble, none more powerful than good people of congenial character joined in intimate friendship. For when two people have the same ideals and the same tastes, each naturally loves the other as himself. So that joins two ideas, one in the before Cicero and one after Cicero. And I want to know if anyone's clever enough to tell me what those two are. I'll read the sentence again. For when two people have the same ideals and the same tastes, each naturally loves the other as himself. One statement's from Aristotle and one statement's from Christianity. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we see now, like items that we pin on a totem pole, we're starting to see how all these ideas are kind of evolving from each other. Let's talk about temptations of ambition. And he says that people who have a lot of talents and like maybe they're excellent in certain ways, they're kind of tempted to maybe cut corners and take power because they know that they're capable. And I think he's probably talking about Julius Caesar here, who is his contemporary. But does that ring true to you? I think that it makes a certain amount of sense for all the reasons he says. And, and it, it's, I think, what Heraclitus said uh, way, way back in week one, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, about the year 500, where he says, one must follow the universal law, namely that which seems common to all. But although the law holds universally, most people make exceptions for themselves. And I'm not going to be held back by all these puny people with their rules and regulations. I'm going to do what I know the right thing to do is. And I think... That's how tyrants actually are created, by people thinking that they're right and actually being right to a certain extent about something, but then kind of losing track of what's required to get along uh, humanely with the rest of society. And when he's talking about the case for public life, he says, but many while pursuing that calm of soul that comes from retirement have withdrawn from civic duty and taken refuge in retirement. Among such people, we find philosophers and other earnest, thoughtful types. Some people have had the same aims as kings, to want nothing, submit to no authority, enjoy their liberty, and in essence, to live just as they please. Who does that remind you of? Who, who have the same aims as, as kings, to want nothing, submit to no authority, enjoy their liberty, and in essence, to live just as they please. Diogenes, and how does that passage remind you of what Diogenes and Alexander have in common? The same aims as kings. This is a very powerful statement. Both Diogenes and Alexander 
They want nothing. That means that they lack nothing. They submit to no authority. They enjoy their liberty and in essence live just as they please. The only difference is that Diogenes has a little bit more of that power to do whatever he wants than Alexander does because Alexander has the, the duties of administering an empire that covers the, almost the whole known earth and Diogenes doesn't have those duties. So he's had all the benefits of being emperor without any of the responsibilities. So that's why I believe Alexander said, if I hadn't been Alexander, I would have liked to have been Diogenes. I believe that sentence explains why Alexander would have said that 300 years before. Let's go on choosing a career. And that kind of gets into integrity, from integrity to choosing a career. I thought it was kind of interesting. He said, remember your superiority to cattle and other beasts. They have no thought except for pleasure, which instinct impels them to seek. Man, by contrast, always investigates or makes captivated by the pleasure of knowing and applying what he knows. Again, ode to humanity there. And then he says, everyone should hold fast to his own peculiar gifts, for we must follow the universal laws of human nature while following the bent of our own particular nature. Even if other careers should seem better or nobler, we may still regulate our own pursuits by the standard of our own stamp. For it does no good to fight against one's nature or to aim at the impossible. Nothing proper goes against the grain in direct opposition to one's natural genius. So he's talking about what comes naturally to you. And he says toward the bottom there, nature exerts the most powerful influence in the choice of a career and fortune the next most powerful. Of the two, nature seems more stable and steadfast than fortune. That means like luck or circumstance. In fact, for fortune to come in conflict with nature seems like a combat between a mortal and a goddess. Now, I thought that's interesting. Nature is so powerful that trying to fight it is, you know, if circumstance trying to fight nature. And people have this uh, debate, which is more important, nature or nurture? So when people are trying to explain how some people are bad, how some people have criminal minds, for instance, they say, oh, it's nature. They were born that way. And then other people say, no, no, it was their nurture. Their mom spanked them too early or their dad beat them with a belt when he came home drunk. So nature versus nurture this is a big debate. Sister is saying it's definitely nature is the, is the most powerful influence, like what you were made to be. Some point, it's like an acorn is meant to grow into a certain kind of oak. You, when you were born, were meant to have a certain unfolding given your temperament. Some people like a lot of loud noise. Some people don't like a lot of loud noise. Some people like sweet. Sometimes people like salty. And when you're parents, if you are, you'll have, and if you have more than one kid, you'll see when they come out, the nurture could be exactly the same, although one's an older child and one a younger, but People are just different straight from the, the get-go. One thing before we go. Under objectivity and caution, <laughs> last paragraph. We should not think that because Socrates or Diogenes did something unconventional, we should do the same. Those famous people acquired that special privilege only by reason of their superhuman excellence. What suits one person seldom perfectly suits another. So if one person is super funny or one person is super strong or whatever, you shouldn't act like that person or you have that person's gifts. And you also shouldn't think that just because Diogenes is kind of amusing by urinating on people that, yeah, it's okay thing for you to do, right? And, and many other things like Howard Rourke and the Fountainhead, just because he says, but I don't think of you, Peter, whatever, doesn't mean that you should say that to someone at your school. First of all, you're not an architect who's been struggling for 12 years and it's just a different context. So I think that's important because on the one hand, we need these moral models to aspire to. And so Caesar tried to emulate Alexander and Alexander tried to em emulate Achilles. But at the same time, if you're trying to be something you're not, that's not good. So if they can inspire you to be your best self, your best version of yourself, that kind of adulation is good. But if you're just like copying someone else's jokes, or someone else's tone of speaking, or rooting for someone's sports team just because they do, growing your hair. But it is inspiring to kind of apply it in your own life.
Martin Luther King, for instance, was inspired by Socrates. He said, I think Socrates would stand up for these laws that make black people sit on the back of the bus. So I'm going to be inspired by Socrates and be a gadfly about that law. But of course, like Socrates, he got killed. He got shot instead of drinking the hemlock. Somebody, some angry white person shot him. So it just goes to show you, if you are going to do something unconventional, you got to be ready to pay the price. Either drinking the hemlock or going to jail, perhaps, or maybe someone will even shoot you. And with that, I've come to the end of what I want to say about it.